It is so good to be with you this morning. I want to encourage you to pull out your note sheet. You can open your Bibles if you have them to Genesis chapter 18. We're going to look at just uh, 15 verses today, not a whole lot. But before we, uh, we get into the text, my wife was sharing uh, that we had the amazing opportunity this week to uh, attend a pastor's conference that was hosted by Answers in Genesis. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that organization. It was uh, started by Ken Ham, who is a great apologist. He is an advocate for young earth creationism. He's a, a brilliant mind who championed the opening of the Creation Museum and more recently, the Ark Encounter. And that's actually where the conference took place, not in the Ark, but uh, in the conference center uh, on the grounds of the Ark in Williamstown, Kentucky. And so uh, we got to hang out by the Ark uh, this week. It was great. We had some time to go through it. It is uh, full of exhibits that give proof that there was actually a, a global flood. And then just 40 minutes north, you have the Creation Museum. Again, phenomenal exhibits. They really highlight the, the wonder of creation, the fact that God created everything that we see in six 24-hour periods. And again, one of those exhibits is called Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. We didn't actually steal the exhibit. They, they sold it in the gift shop, all right? And so we brought it back. But I, I do want to encourage you to take some time to look through that. Phenomenal exhibit that shows how you and I are fearfully and wonderfully created uh, in the womb. Amen. And uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I'm just encouraged by that trip. I, I do want to encourage you, if you're able to, to plan a trip to go out to the Ark Encounter. It's, a, it's an 11-hour drive from here. If you don't like to drive, it's a quick flight to Cincinnati, and they're both right there, about a one-and-a-half-hour flight to Cincinnati. And so, parents, I would encourage some of you, next, uh, next summer, forget Woke Disney, okay? Take, take the kids to the Creation Museum. Take them to the Ark Encounter. You will be greatly encouraged, uh, built up in your faith. Amen. At the conference, we were able to hear from some uh, tremendous pastors, leaders, some apologists for the faith. And, and the truth is, I can't walk away from a time like that. I don't think anybody could uh, without feeling tremendously challenged. The theme of the conference was authority, and it was really focused on answering the compromise that we're seeing in so much of the church today. The messages were focused on the authority of Scripture, the authority of, of Christ, the sufficiency of Christ. Uh, we were given instruction on how to hold on to God's promises in a world of compromise. And there, there were a number of things that were shared that just greatly impacted us. I'm going to share them over the weeks ahead. But this morning, uh, before we dig into the text, I want to share with you a number that was brought up at the conference that really shocked me. And that number is 41 million. 41 million. Write that down. 41 million. It was shared by one of the speakers at the conference that according to a very recent Barna survey, that is the number of born-again Christians that are planning not to vote in the upcoming election. There are approximately 41 million people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ that are, are looking at the candidates for president of the United States and they're saying, you know what, I'm just going to sit this one out. And I know the argument, I've heard it already, Pastor, I can't bring myself to vote for the lesser of two evils, but please hear me this morning. As long as Jesus' name is not on the ballot, you will always be voting for the lesser of two evils. <laughs> and, and, and here's the truth. In the kingdom of God, there is no neutral position. You are either standing for righteousness or you are allowing evil to prosper. There's no evil, no, no uh, neutral position, right? Before Jesus' crucifixion, think about it. Pilate said, I want to stay neutral. He didn't want to take sides, and so... He washed his hands of a decision regarding Christ, but in not deciding, he decided. Washing his hands was not a neutral position. He stepped back and allowed the enemies of Christ to crucify him. And so I want to challenge you this morning. If you're thinking of sitting this election out, if you stand back and you, you stay out of the election, that's not a neutral position. By not casting a vote, you're casting a vote. And so I want to encourage you this morning just in a number of ways as, as your pastor. Number one, I want to encourage you to register to vote. Okay, it's simple. Elections.ny.gov. The deadline, I think, in New York is the 26th, and so I would encourage you to do it today. You can pull out your phone right now <laughs> and begin to register to vote. Don't sit on the sidelines for this one. There is no neutral position. You can't wash your hands of this. Then you say, Pastor, but how do I vote? Let me say a few things. As a pastor, I just kind of make it a rule that I don't endorse candidates. However, I do endorse policies. I can tell you, and I, I believe I should tell you, what Scripture says about the issues of our day. 
And, and I want you to remember that as you vote this year, you're not voting on a pastor, okay? Both candidates have flawed personalities. I'm sorry to offend, but in this case, I'm an equal opportunity offender. Both have flawed personalities, right? Both candidates have flawed personalities. And so I don't encourage you, don't vote on personality, vote on policies. Vote in a way that promotes righteousness or right living. The Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 12, 9, that we should hate what is evil and we should cling to what is good. Meaning that when you cast your vote on election day or before that, if you do a mail-in ballot, right, when you cast your vote, you should ask what policies promote righteousness or right living. Two big issues before me today when I consider this election as a believer. Again, someone who takes the word of God as my authority. And the first is the sanctity of human life. Again, we had the the privilege of hosting the Karenet Banquet here again on Friday night. The the sanctity of human life is important to us as a church. As we've gone through the book of Genesis, it's already told us that God made man in in his image, right? Male and female. And so according to scripture, human life is created in the image of God. What that means is all human life is sacred. All life is sacred from the womb until the tomb. And the question that's asked so often now in regards to life is, when does life begin? They used to say this, that life begins at conception. However, the world has begun to redefine the word conception. And what they're saying it means now, well, it's not the time when the egg and sperm meet, but rather at the point at which the embryo attaches to the wall of the uterus. Now, why the change? Why the change in meaning? It's to make room for the abortion pill, which prevents the embryo from attaching to the uterus, Right? And so I think we need to, to change our wording. I'm changing my wording to be clear that life begins at fertilization, that it is sacred from the moment, from that moment, and it is not yours or mine to take. Now, I, I realize when we talk about the topic of abortion that this is a topic that may be personal to many of you in the room. It's estimated that 13% of women will have an abortion by age 25 and one in four by age 45. We heard a powerful testimony on Friday night at the Karenet Banquet from a woman who had three abortions, and yet God has redeemed her story. Now she's the director of two pro-life care centers in Pennsylvania. And and so I want to say, if you're here today and you've gone through an abortion, I want to be very clear that there is healing and there is forgiveness available. There is healing and there is forgiveness that's available. God can redeem your story. Yet as the people of God, we need to unashamedly stand for life in the womb. Again, I'm so thankful for CareNet, this ministry right here in Rockland that gives women that are in unplanned pregnancies information, support to carry that child to birth. Now let me be clear, when it comes to the abortion issue, I don't agree with either candidate 100% because to me, neither candidate goes far enough in support of life. But you need to know where the candidates stand on the issue because one candidate has made it clear That if elected, they will codify Roe v. Wade as the law of the land. They will inscribe the abortion rights of Roe v. Wade into federal law, making access to abortion even easier. And so when you vote, I want to encourage you, vote as if millions of lives depend on it because they do. You say, Pastor, well, that's one issue. Yes, it is. But it's also an issue that's important enough to me that if it were the only issue, it would affect the way I vote. Again, I'm voting in such a way as to promote righteousness or righteous living. And abortion is not the only issue before me. There's another one that's troubling me, and it's the issue that's at the the forefront, what's being called today gender-affirming care. And the real question surrounding that issue is, what will our, our response as a nation be to the social contagion of transgenderism? Yes, it is a social contagion right now. The New York Times just reported that one out of every 33 high school kids in the U.S. right now identifies as trans. One out of 33. It's a a tremendous increase in a very short period of time. The DSM-4, which is the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual of Mental Disorders, it was in place from uh, DSM-4 was 1994 to 2013. At at that time, it was estimated that transsexualism affected one out of every 30,000 males and one out of 100,000 females. Not one in 33, one in 30,000, one in 100,000. And so in a little over 10 years, this has increased by a factor of 1,000. That is what a social contagion looks like. And so how will the United States as a nation respond to confusion over sexual identity? 
What we're seeing right now is a booming industry full of so-called physicians taking advantage of that confusion for financial gain. If you look at the map that I have up here, all of the areas that are in red, they have a law or a policy banning sex changes for minors, for children. And it's absolutely insane to me today that the whole map is not red. When we're talking about minors, especially children, right? Absolute insanity that we don't trust minors to drink or to vote, but we trust them to make life-altering decisions about their bodies. Again, there are evil men and women that are profiting off of this confusion. The orange states have laws that are pending, but all the gray states, yes, that includes New York. They do not. Now, this past summer, the White House made an unofficial statement that so-called gender-affirming care, I say so-called, that it should be limited to adults. Now, at any other point in our nation's history, that statement would be ridiculed because, again, it doesn't go far enough. Like, mutilating someone's body to conform to an image in the mind is wrong whether the victim is an adult or a child. But that was the unofficial stance of the White House. And for that simple statement, they were attacked by trans activists who believed that doctors should be able to mutilate children's bodies at any age without interference from the government. And so all of that pushback, it really created a major headache for the current administration at an inconvenient time. And so the White House quickly put out a new statement to shut all these activists up. And the new statement was signed by President Biden's policy advisor, Neera Tandon. And in that statement, the White House reaffirmed their support of gender-affirming surgeries, mutilation of minors. At the same time, they claim that these surgeries, well, they're not really happening. This is not really taking place in any significant number. This is very rare. It was the same approach that was used early on with abortion when it was said that abortion should be safe and rare. It's not rare and it's not safe. And neither is what's happening to children today in our, in our nation. There's an organization known as Do No Harm that represents physicians, nurses, medical students, patients, policymakers, and they're focused on keeping identity politics out of the medical system. They just released a database this past week, actually October 8th, that clearly shows what is taking place among minors in our country. And can I just say, if you spend a little time on their website, the findings are horrific. Church, we can't shut our eyes to this abuse. Key national findings from 2019 to 2023, here's what they say. 13,994 children received sex change-related treatments. 5,747 sex change surgeries were performed on children. 62,682 hormone and puberty blockers prescriptions were written for 8,579 pediatric patients. At least $119 million was made from sex treatments performed on minors. These numbers only scratch the surface because they only tell us those things that have gone through insurance. And so they're just scratching the surface of how widespread these practices are. And so in response to this social contagion, evil men and evil women are profiting. Uh, You can go to the database. You can see the hospitals in in this area even that are participating in the madness. Let me bring it close to home. Bardonia Pediatrics is a part of Boston Children's Health Physicians, Boston Hospital. Boston Hospital is one of Do No Harm's Dirty Dozen, one of the top offenders in the U.S. They offer sex change treatments for children three ages three and up. Yes, three years old. They've performed at least 159 sex change surgeries on minors, including at least 65 double mastectomies on girls. One doctor there has profited over $5 million from sex change surgeries and treatments on minors. And so if your child is a patient at Bardonia Pediatrics, do yourself a favor. Find a new pediatrician. (laughs) And don't sneak out. Tell them why you're leaving. See, I don't think there's a single person in this room today that would not agree that the mutilation of a child's body is evil. However, when you look at the candidate's take on this issue, I think you're going to see drastically different worldviews, drastically different approaches. And if you're here today, and let me say this, if you're here today and you struggle with your sexual identity, I want you to know this, that the scripture offers hope. It makes it clear that God is the one who determines our sexuality. It's not something we need to wrestle with. It's not something we need to worry about. It's not something we need to figure out. And so rather than changing the body to fit an image in your mind, I would encourage you to allow your mind to be transformed, to change by the word of God. Let God's word, let the truth of who he says you are, let it bring you into an understanding of who you are. 
Because that's the only way that you're going to find joy and lasting peace. And so again, here's my encouragement as your pastor. Register to vote. And vote in such a way that promotes righteousness. Now you may say, well, pastor, there's so many other issues on the table. I agree. You may say, what about their economic plan for America? Isn't that important? Really, I would say this, that's secondary. Because no economic plan will lead to prosperity without righteousness. The book of Proverbs makes it clear that it is righteousness that exalts a nation. It is right living. That's the only thing that will exalt the United States of America. Sin, turning from God's ways, will always bring reproach. Sin will always bring condemnation. You know, it was shared at the conference, I I believe it to be true, that according to Scripture, we are salt and light in the world. The Word of God doesn't call us to be salt and light. It says we are salt and light. Salt has a preserving property. Light exposes what's kept in darkness. Let's hold up the word of God, church, and and let's vote in such a way as to preserve our nation and shed light on darkness. Amen? Amen. So encourage you, encourage you. (laughs) Register to vote and be prayerful as as you take that step. Genesis chapter 18, are you still there? Genesis chapter 18. What we're going to read this morning must have happened a short time after the events of Genesis 17. If you remember last week in Genesis 17, 21, God said that that Sarah would give birth one year later. At this point, she's not pregnant, and so what does that mean? It means this could not have been more than three months after the events of the previous chapter. Let's read there in verse 1. It says, And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. Now, this first verse, if you look at it, it's really an overview of the chapter. Verse 2 is going to get into details. But here's what we know. Abraham is back by the terebinth trees in Mamre. This is a a significant place. It's a sacred place in Abraham's life. He moved there when he came back uh, from Egypt into the promised land. Later on, we're going to see that he uh, purchases a cave at Mamre. That's where Sarah will be buried. Abraham and his son Isaac will actually be buried there as well. But it's in that place that Abraham has a revelation of God. I hope you know this morning, it's not a light thing to have a revelation from God. And and according to Scripture, when we have a a revelation, we are accountable for what we know. We're accountable for what's been revealed to us by the grace of God. How amazing that that Abraham gets to see God. Uh, Again, to have that revelation, to, to see God in person must have been amazing. And yet I want you to know today that we've been given a revelation from God as well. God still appears to his people, amen? He, he reveals himself through his written word. And that does not mean that he, he cannot manifest his presence. But I would say this, that's the exception rather than the rule. Hebrews 1 verse 1 tells us long ago that many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Today God speaks. Hope you know that. He still speaks. He speaks through his son. And and John 1.14 makes it clear that the son is the word of God. According to John 14.26, the Holy Spirit then comes and he reminds us of what the son says. And so God's appearance, his revelation to you and I through his word, can I just say, is is no less significant than his revelation to Abraham. That means that we are just as accountable for what we do with that revelation. God has spoken through his word. If you've heard today, it means you are responsible to act on what you've heard. And I want you to see how Abraham responds because I, I think as we look at this chapter, it should give us a pattern for our response to a revelation from God. Look at verse 2. It says, He lifted up his eyes and he looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the earth. These three men show up at Abraham's tent unannounced. They, they come in the middle of the day. Scripture makes it clear it's during the heat of the day. And this is not a, a time that people would go out. It's not a time to go out and pay visits. In that time, in that place, Man, you wake up and you you do your chores early in the morning. It's still cool in the morning. Later in the day, when the sun goes down, okay, we can work again. But during the heat of the day, you just sit in your tent and you you chill and you you try to stay cool. And so Abraham is, he's chilling. He's in the tent. (laughs) And these visitors arrive. 
he looks up and he sees three men standing in front of him. Now, who are these men? Because there are three, the Church of England has interpreted this as the Trinity. They say it is three persons, the, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so on Trinity Sunday, they read the first part of Genesis 18. But I, I think it's best that we see one of these men as the Lord. Again, I would say that this is a Christophany. It is an appearance of Christ to Abraham. This is the Lord, and I believe there are two angels with him. Why do I say that? Well, when we get to verse 22, it says, So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. So I believe there are three, two leave, and Abraham is still standing before the Lord, okay? When we get to chapter 19, we're going to see that it's two angels. I believe it's the same two angels that come to Sodom in the evening. But Abraham sees these men, and he recognizes that one of them is the Lord. You know, there's a, a phrase in modern Christianity, uh, i got to be honest, that drives me crazy. Often people will say, I've made Jesus Lord, <laughs> And I get what they're saying. They're saying, I, I've given God that, that place of lordship. I've given Jesus that place of lordship in my life. But here's the reality. You and I do not make Jesus Lord. He is Lord. He is Lord. And, and, and the question is whether you recognize him as Lord or not. The, the word of God makes it clear. We sang it in the song this morning that one day every knee will bow and, and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day every single knee will bow. That means you can bow today in willing submission or you will be forced to bow before his glory at the judgment. But what should your life look like? What should my life look like when I recognize Jesus' lordship? A couple of things I want to give to you today. Number one, I would say this, that if I'm recognizing Jesus' lordship, if I'm calling him lord of my life, my life should be marked by humility. You see, Abraham, he gets up and he runs. Why? Because the Lord is present. He's not going to sit idle in the tent. Yeah, he was, he was relaxing a minute ago, but the presence of God is there. God is in the house. And can I just say, it's not a casual thing when God shows up in the room. And so Abraham runs to the door. How do we respond when God is speaking to us through his word? Is there a debate? <laughs> is there a hesitation? How quickly do we respond as God speaks to us? And so Abraham runs to the door and he, he bows before the Lord. In that time and place, if you were to greet someone as royalty, if you, you found yourself in, in the presence of the king, you would get on your knees before them and you would slowly incline your forehead until it touched the ground. And what you were saying was you were higher. You were more significant. You, you deserve to be reverenced. You see, God shows up in the room, and that's Abraham's immediate response. I, I, listen, I don't think we bow enough in worship today. I'll just be honest. I don't think we, we often reverence God for who he is. Maybe it's because we've spent too much time singing, I'm a friend of God, and not enough time singing, holy, holy, holy. Listen, because of his mercy toward you and I, God has acted as a friend to us. But please understand today, Jesus is not your homeboy. Amen. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Jesus is not your homeboy. He is your Lord. Amen. And he should be reverenced as such. Amen. Just think about Isaiah's response to a revelation of God's glory. Isaiah chapter 6 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe it filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy. He is the thrice holy God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I'm lost. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. In the midst of a revelation of God, Isaiah gets really humble. He doesn't say, wow is me. He says, woe is me. In the midst of God's holiness, he recognizes his brokenness. You see, his life is marked by humility, and our lives will be too when we see the lordship of God Almighty. 
at this point in the account of Abraham, think about it, he's 99 years old. He has at least 318 paid trained servants. He's made an impact in his culture. He won this great battle, right? If he were alive today, he would be known as a Sikh, okay? And yet he bows in God's presence. That's why I love times of worship. Listen to me, church. When we truly worship God, there's going to be humility. (laughs) Humility in worship, it comes from two things, though. Write this down. Number one, it comes from recognizing who God is. But secondly, it comes from recognizing who we are in his presence. Recognizing who God is, but also recognizing who we are in his presence. And once you get those two things straight in your life, hear me, there will always be humility. I I guarantee it. Abraham says, oh Lord, the word there is Adonai. That's the Hebrew word. That's the word that he uses for the Lord. And the word that he uses for himself, look at it, is servant. And so God is Adonai. He's the almighty God. He says, if I've found favor, interesting statement, right? Like, didn't he already know that he found favor with God? That's the belief that was credited to him as righteousness. It's because of his belief that God granted Abraham the mercy that would one day be merited by the cross. And so in this moment, I, I, I doubt that Abraham realized that he was looking into the face of the one who would die in his place. I doubt that he realized that he was beholding the Lamb of God. But what he did know was that this was the Lord, and this is the one that he looked to for salvation. And so what is Abraham really asking here? I I believe he's pleading for another encounter with God. Most of you are here this morning because like Abraham, you desire another encounter with God. You want the the word of God. You you want God's presence on a Sunday morning to speak to your heart. You you want it to change you. And so you plead like Abraham. I hope you do as you come into the house of the Lord. God, if if I found favor in your eyes, don't pass me by today. Speak to me today. Change me. And just like Abraham, I want you to know you can be certain that he will not pass you by. Because you are in a covenant relationship with him. Oh, that that would be our prayer, church. Lord, do not. Do not pass me by. But there's another aspect that we see here of a life that that recognizes lordship. I would say for us, it's Jesus' lordship. When I recognize Jesus as my Lord, my life will be marked with humility, yes, but it will also be marked by service. Like if, if Jesus is truly Lord and you are his servant, then that means that there is a requirement for service, a, a requirement to get involved in his kingdom work. Abraham serves the Lord here, and he does it in three ways. First of all, he does it personally. Think about it. I mean, he's a rich man. He's got many servants. He could have simply (laughs) clapped his hands, right? He does that. People start moving, right? But here we see Abraham personally moving. Now, another word for service is ministry. And I would say this. a, A Christian without ministry is a contradiction in terms. Because if Jesus is your Lord, it means you are he's your master. And if he's your master, it means you are his servant. And so what that means is when you are serving people, you need to remember, first of all, that you are serving the Lord. Often people get burned out in ministry for the Lord because they forget they're serving the Lord. Listen, if you serve people, you're going to get tired because serving people is not easy, right? I remember talking to my father early on about the joys and, and the struggles of being a pastor. And I remember him talking about the great joy that there is in shepherding the church. But he also said this, don't forget Sheep bite. (laughs) Sheep bite. There's great joy in ministering in the way that God has called me to minister, but I need to remember my service is first and foremost to the Lord. If you think about the priests of Israel, Scripture tells us that they served God's people. They presented the sacrifice for God's people, and yet Scripture makes it clear that they ministered unto the Lord. And so Abraham, he served personally. He also served immediately. Look what it says there in verse 4. He says, let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourself under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread. Now, what he's about to do is something that an Italian would do. I'm going to bring you a snack, and it's not going to be a snack, right? You want a little something, and he's going to go prepare something huge, right? A little morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves, and after that, you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly to the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and he 
took a calf, it was a tender and good calf, and he gave it to the young man who quickly prepared it. Then he took the curds and the milk and the calf that he had prepared, and he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Abraham hurried to serve. Notice what he says to Sarah. He says, make it quickly. He, he runs to the herds. There, there's this sense of urgency. And, and here's why it's important that we see that. Because if you are, are, are waiting for the right feeling to start serving, you will likely never serve. <laughs> like, like if Abraham just wasn't feeling it that day, right? I, don't, I don't feel like it. Uh, you know, my heart's not in it. It's hot. No one can work in this heat. Not an old man like me, right? Plus, he's got people that can do the work for him, so why not have them do the work? But his service is personal. It's personal unto the Lord. It's immediate, but it's also marked by generosity. Don't miss what we just read in the text. He requests three measures of fine flour. He says, give me the best flour you got. He, he looks at, at, at the, the goats and the calf, and he says, which is the best? Give me, give me the best one. Tell me which one's tender, which, which one's good. I, I, I want to give the best. He gives generously to the Lord, and he gives the best of what he has. And I believe this morning that we should give God the very best of what we have. We should give God the very best of who we are. Too many people give God what's left over, right? There's something in the house that's old and it's broken. It's getting in the way. Maybe the church wants it. Call the church, right? It doesn't serve me well, I'll give it to the church. Now, to be honest, Pastor Jose would probably sell it in a yard sale and make lots of money. Are you, but are you with me today? Don't give God just what's left over. Don't give him what's left over of your time, what's left over of your energy, what's left over of your finances. Give him the first part. Give him the best part. Give him the best and watch him bless the rest. I, I, I think of David in 2 Samuel 24. Right? He's, he's looking for a place to, to build the temple, and he sees the, the threshing floor of Aruna, and, and he offers to buy it for a price. He says, let me buy that from you. And, and the owner of it says, well, I, I know you're King David, and I, I know what you're going to use it for, and so you don't have to pay me. You can have it for free. Now, listen to David's response. He says, no, I will buy them from you at full price. I won't offer to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Can you imagine arguing like that? Like most of us argue the other way around. Like free, that's not good enough. Give me more free stuff, right? I'm King David, right? Give me something else for free, right? Most of us argue in, in the other direction. But David says, I'm not going to sacrifice to the Lord what costs me nothing. Church, that's a good principle to live by. That if you're going to give something to the Lord, you should feel it. <laughs> I should feel it. It's, it's, it's got to cost me something. I'm going to give God my best, and, and that's going to come at a cost, and that's only right after all my master has given me something that's come at the greatest cost. You see, I, I think Abraham had the same mindset. Man, I'm going to be generous with God because God has been so generous to me. <laughs> and, and, and here's the reality. As generous as you may become in your life, you will never, never outgive God. Verse 9, and they said to him, together in one accord, I guess they say this, where is Sarah, your wife? Now, remember, her name used to be Sarai, so apparently they know her name has changed, right? And he said, she's in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, remember, Abraham was just told, it couldn't have been more than three months ago, that Sarah would be the mother of the promised child in one year, okay? And so now there's, there's a clear uh, timeline to the promise, right? The, the child's going to be born at the appointed time. And so Sarah's listening at the tent door behind him. Now, just in case we would happen to forget the conditions of this couple, what they're facing, we're reminded there in verse 11, now Abraham and Sarah were old, <laughs> And it says advanced in years. That's a nicer way to say old, right? I prefer that. I'm advanced in years, all right? But then it makes it clear. The way of, the women, uh, of women had ceased to be with Sarah. They were advanced in years. Sarah has gone through menopause. The way of women has ceased with her. You, you see, Moses, the writer of Genesis, he wants you to know and he wants I, me to know that it is impossible at this point in the natural for Sarah to have a child. And so verse 12, so Sarah laughed to herself. 
It's like after I'm worn out and my Lord Abraham is old, shall I have pleasure? Now, it sounds to me as I read this text like Abraham did not communicate to Sarah the last thing that God had said. (laughs) Because she hears this and it's like a surprise. Now, maybe he got distracted by the whole circumcision thing, right? That's understandable, okay? But she's obviously taken by surprise when she hears this statement as she eavesdrops on the conversation in the tent. And so she laughs. Scripture, it's not out loud. She laughs to herself. But her laugh is not a laugh of joy. Rather, it is one of unbelief. She's looking at her body. She's looking at Abraham's. She's looking at the situation and say, God can't do that. Now, we, we know that from God's response in, in, in verse 13, that that's exactly what she was thinking, right? The, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? And here's the question of all questions. Write this down, verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? You know, I'm certain of this, that God must be amazed that you and I doubt his ability so often. Like we look around at the the world that he created from the words of his mouth, and yet at times we doubt that he can bring even the simplest things to pass. But we need to, hear me church, we need to come to that place where by faith we actually believe that God is able to do everything he says he will do. That he's able to uh, accomplish every promise that he speaks. Sarah laughs. And in that moment as she laughs, she's busted. (laughs) Now last chapter, I don't remember Abraham laughed and God said nothing. Why? Because I, I, I believe that, that Abraham believed. That there was no unbelief in him regarding the promise. That's what Scripture tells us. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so Abraham's laughter was a laughter of joy. Sarah's laughter was one of unbelief. She, she looks at her body, and, and she looks at Abraham, and she says, Ha! Huh? No way that's happening. I'm old. This is impossible. But, but there's one more mark of a life that recognizes Jesus' lordship. You see, when you recognize Jesus as lord of your life, your life will be marked by humility. It will be marked by service, but it will also be marked by conformity to God's will. You will conform your life to God's promises, and you will obey what he says to do. What that means is that you and I should find those places in Scripture where the word of God speaks to our situation. And in those places, we make a decision to follow God's word. Like you read those things and then you put them into practice. You, you recognize uh, Jesus' lordship in your church life, in your home life, in your workplace, in your relationships, in your, your leisure time. And you recognize his lordship and you conform to his will in that area. That's conformity to the will of God. And here's the reality. We can conform to God's will because we see God is more than able to do everything he says. You, you look at his promise. And maybe read a verse like, he who began a good work and he was able to bring it to completion. And, and you read that verse and you, and you look at your life and sometimes you wonder, am I ever going to be conformed to the image of Christ? <laughs> Maybe I stumble and I fall. Uh, am I ever going to reach that point? Well, he says in Scripture that he will do it. And so you can doubt for a moment, but then you begin to look and you see how far he's taken you. That, that you're not who you want to be, but thank God you're not who you used to be, right? And as you do that, you, you begin to allow your, your mind to be conformed to the truth of Scripture, and, and you allow the Holy Spirit to conform you to his image. You say, well, he says it in the Word, he's going to do it. Yes, God can make a a 95-year-old woman conceive. In fact, we're going to see later on, he can make a virgin conceive. (laughs) Like nothing is impossible for him. Nothing is, is too hard. Actually, the translation there says too wonderful. It's really too incredible. Nothing is too wonderful. Nothing is too incredible for him to do. Is it too hard for God to save that loved one that you've been praying for for years? Is it too uh, incredible to imagine that he could actually transform your life? Is it impossible for him to see you through this trial that you're walking through right now? Verse 15, but Sarah denied it. I love this. Saying, I I didn't laugh. Why? She was afraid. (laughs) 
He said, no, you did laugh. Sarah doesn't laugh out loud and, and at that point. It's, the accusation comes, and so she thinks she can deny it. Nobody heard it, right? There's this conviction that comes with her unbelief, and so she says, I, I didn't laugh. It's like all of us trying to justify ourselves, right? We often do the same thing, and we forget that honesty and humility make us the people who we should be. Sure, we can deceive others, but we never deceive God. But as we come to the end of this chapter, here's what I want you to see. I want you to see once again that we have the beauty of Scripture. And the beauty of Scripture is that it doesn't hide from us the failings of the heroes of the faith. I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. Hope it gives you hope as well, too. These are, are people just like us because this is a true account from history. This is not a fairy tale. But in this moment, Sarah knows, wow, God can see my heart. There's nothing that I can hide from. He heard that. I thought I was keeping it to myself. Remember, Hagar said that God is the God who sees. But now Sarah knows personally just how much God sees. Today, he sees every thought. He sees every thought, which means he sees right down to the desires of your heart this morning. He knows if our desire today is to recognize him as Lord. And, and when you truly do that, when you say, you know what? He is Lord. I'm going to recognize him as such. I don't make him Lord. He is Lord. I'm going to recognize him that way in my life. When you recognize Jesus as Lord, your life will be characterized by humility. Man, you'll start to see God for who he is. You'll also see who you are in his presence. And the result of that is always a life of humility. If you recognize Jesus as Lord in your life, your life will be marked by humility, but it will also be marked by service in the kingdom of God. You'll serve him personally. You, you won't wait for others to do what God's calling you to do. You will serve immediately. You, you won't wait till you feel like it to serve. You'll serve generously, giving God the very best of everything. And when Jesus is truly Lord, more, more than anything, your life will be marked by conformity to his will. You'll understand that his plan is the best. And you'll trust that nothing is impossible. Nothing is, is too wonderful. Nothing is too hard for God to accomplish in your life. Would you stand with me this morning? Listen, church, I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you grew up in the church. Maybe you've known of God. Maybe you're familiar with the word of God. But maybe today, if you're honest, you would say, I haven't given God the rightful place in my life. I haven't made him Lord. I, I haven't responded to him the way that I should. My, my life is, is not marked by humility. Uh, so often we, we come to God, we come to him with all the things we're going to give to him. Here's all the things I could do. That's not a posture of humility. But with heads bowed around the room today, Maybe you would say, God, help me to see you for who you truly are. Help me to see who I am in, in your presence. God, would you make my life be marked by humility? Or maybe it's that, that place of service. You, you've been waiting to, to step in and, and serve when you feel like it. You say, God's going to eventually make me want to do this. And so I'm waiting on that. I'll, I'll serve when I feel like it. But today I pray you would understand that he, if he's your master, he's your Lord, then you are his servant. Which means that service in the kingdom is a requirement. <laughs> so maybe God would stir in your heart to, to get involved, to, to begin to serve. Whether it's here in the church, it's in the nursing home, it's in some place where God's highlighting something. Listen, if he's highlighting it to you, <laughs> don't wait for somebody else to do it. <laughs> Respond to that calling on your life. But finally, I want to say this. If he's truly Lord... If he's truly in control, if we truly believe, like the scripture says, that nothing is impossible for God, if we believe that the God who spoke this world into existence is still at work in our lives today, then we will say, no, nothing is too hard for him. Nothing is too impossible. And so what that means is that I conform my life to his plan. 
I don't look at the circumstances and say, well, that's too difficult. <laughs> he could never do that. No, if he's leading me that way, I trust that he will accomplish it. Where, where he calls me, he will provide for what I need. When he calls me to do something, he will equip me to do it. And so my life begins to be conformed to his image and to his will. Whatever the Holy Spirit's highlighting right now, whether it's a lack of humility or a lack of service or a lack of conformity, I want you to take a moment and just ask the Holy Spirit to work in that area in your life. Each of us could probably highlight one of those. But as the Holy Spirit highlights it today, I want you to respond and just say, Lord, would you help me in this? It's his desire that you would walk in humility. It's his desire that you would serve him with joy. <laughs> it's his desire that your life would be conformed to his image. So take a moment even right now. Say, God, help me. Change me.